Right. I think we are ready to start. So, um, welcome everybody, um, and thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm really pleased to uh, introduce um, today's speaker, Sergey Gurib. Uh, Sergey's so research and interests are in the, a number of different areas in economics, including contract theory, deliverability, uh, which he offered a uh, paper initially <laughs> to to, uh, to present today, and deliverability. Um, but the other one is political economics, and so today's paper is a synthesis of literature on one particular aspect of uh, political economics, uh, that of populism. Um, so just before we start uh, the seminar, two. Uh, things as usual. Um, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A or the chat function, uh, or you can uh, use the, the raise hand function uh, if you want to ask directly and I'll unmute you. Uh, and the other thing is to say that the, this, the webinar is being recorded. It will be available along with the paper uh, by Monday at the latest uh, next week. <clears throat> so um, with that, uh, floor is yours, uh, Sergey. Um, just to say, uh, um, Sergey will pause from time to time during the seminar to answer questions. So if you have any, anything during, during the seminar, just as I said, please put it on chat uh, or Q&A. Uh, floor is yours, I'll mute myself. Um, Thank you very much, Matlob. And indeed, um, this is a, not a research paper, but, but a survey, a joint uh, uh, long paper with uh, Elias Papayano. So this is a, uh, 100 plus long uh, survey, which uh, is conditionally accepted at the Journal of Economic Literature. And uh, I will not be able to present everything today, but uh, indeed the paper will be available online. The current draft will be available online. We are currently revising it. And uh, yet within this uh, next uh, 35, 40 minutes, I will try to uh, summarize the main takeaways we got from reading several hundred papers on populism that came out in recent years. So let me first start with the uh, observation that the interest in populism has been growing in 21st century, but the real jump was in 2016. So if you think about uh, uh, that populism is a big issue in today's debate, this is correct and mostly the jump was at the time of Brexit referendum and uh, the victory of um, Donald Trump. So this is the number of papers that have been published uh, in, in Factiva with populism or populist in the title. Now people, uh, normal people, uh, reacted with searching in Google what populism is. And uh, you see the jump was in 2016, 2017, and then it has declined. People apparently have learned what populism populist is. And uh, in that sense, that was also the same time, but that jump was relatively uh, short-lived. Uh, short so what uh, else has happened? The academics started to pay attention, and indeed the share of papers in JSTOR uh, with populism and populist in the title or abstract has been growing slowly in the 21st century, but in 2017, a year after the uh, crucial year of 2016, uh, there was a jump, and uh, this jump is substantial. We are talking about doubling or tripling number of papers looking at the issues of populism. So what are the four questions I'm going to focus on during this talk? And, the and this is actually the focus of our survey, is what is populism? How do we define it? How we quantify its rise? Uh, how we measure it? So that would be the first question. And I will spend relatively more time on this introductory question because my experience is that this is the question that people struggle with a lot because especially in economics, we have uh, a, a definition of populism which is outdated. And if you've not uh, looked at the literature for the last 20 years, then you can actually be misled by what's going on in the social sciences uh, scholarship of, of, of populism. Now, uh, then the main part of the talk will be the drivers of populism. So I'll tell you in the first part that populism has indeed risen in the recent uh, couple of decades and especially in the last decade. And then I will try to tell you what we know uh, about the factors that drive this recent rise of populism. And so I'll talk about economic and non-economic factors. 
for GLO, what is important, I'll talk about the long-term changes in the labor market, and I will talk about the changes which uh, happened in the last 10 years after the global economic crisis 2008, 2009. But I also talk about non-economic issues such as immigration, identity, uh, the rise of uh, internet. So these are also important questions. Now, another issue is the implications. Is populism bad? Should we worry about the rise of populism? In short, the answer is populism is rather bad than good, which brings us to the fourth question, which is, if we think it's bad, uh, what, are going with, uh, what can be done about this? What should be done about this? And uh, to jump ahead, I should tell you that, unfortunately, uh, while there is a discussion what needs to be done, of course, there is much less research on the last question, on the fourth question, on what needs to be done. So let me start with defining populism. This is uh, a very uh, important part of my talk. So if you read the books about populism, then you see that there is a reasonably vague um, definition, approach to classifying po politicians or parties as populists. So I, I will quote Mueller, Jan Werner Mueller, who wrote a book about populism before 2016. And uh, basically he opens the book with uh, saying, is everyone that we, meaning we experts, we scholars, do not like is a populist. Barry Eichengreen has written a book on history of populism, the last hundred years of populism, and he actually refers to the judge of U.S. Supreme Court, uh, Supreme, uh, uh, Court uh, um, definition of pornography. I know it when I see it. So for Eichengreen, many political scientists or many economists would just say, we know this party is populist. We know this politician is populist. And uh, there is indeed a feeling, you can see in the media, that the elites, usually want to label populist anybody they don't like. Anybody who says the liberal democratic centrist consensus is wrong. And uh, uh, in that sense, it's also insufficient, unsatisfactory definition. So we want, uh, we want to figure out better definition. So, uh, so what are the better definitions? Well, if you uh, go back 20, 30 years and ask an economist what populism is, they would definitely give you the definition from Dornbusch and Edwards' book on populism in Latin America. And basically there they would have a clear-cut definition of populism that really works for populism in Latin America but doesn't really work for most of European populists today. So for Dornbusch and Edwards, this is a typical macroeconomic left-wing populism, which is approach to economics that emphasizes growth and redistribution and de-emphasizes the risks of inflation and budget deficit, external constraints and uh, reaction of agents to non-market policies. And so they describe in their book the uh, episodes of macroeconomic populism in Latin America, how these populists uh, bring their economies to macroeconomic collapse and uh, those promises that they make are not consistent with macroeconomic constraints and that of course ends in disaster. So it's all about unsustainable macroeconomic policies and unsustainable promises in general. And this is how economists used to think about populism. Now, do we still see left-wing populists like this? Well, we do see people like this, politicians like this, even in Europe and Greece and Spain, and in many Latin American countries still. Uh, most of them are now out of office, even in uh, Latin American countries. In Europe, if I have time, I will talk about the experience in Greece. But in general, most of uh, today's uh, populism is actually different. It's uh, not what uh, classical Latin American populists were. So we need to use an another definition. And this definition would come from uh, political science. And there is a political scientist, Cass Mude, who offered a definition already in early 2000s. And then recently, uh, with his uh, co-author, Cristobal Ravira Kaltwasser, they wrote a number of papers, including this short book, a very brief introduction to populism, which uh, crystallizes this definition. So basically, according to their definition, populism is not really, is not really an ideology. It's more a view of the world. And this view of the world uh, is based on the division of the society into corrupt elites and morally pure people. And uh, 
What is also important, both of those groups are homo internally homogenous. So pure people are the same. There are, no, there are no differences within the people. And so these two parts of this definition imply very clearly that since elites are corrupt, we need people to govern. We need to give the power to the people. This is one. The second implication is since the people are homogenous, there are no need there is no need for checks and balances, for, um, uh, for protection of minorities, for diversity policies, because the real people are all the same. So there is no need for a differentiation within the people or between the people. And so this is why uh, Moody and Ravira Kaltwasser call this thin centered ideology. There is no ideology. This, I, the whole ideology is anti-elite sentiment and pretty much anti-checks and balances. Checks and balances are hated by populists also because usually checks and balances involve technocrats, unelected uh, officials, judges, central bankers, uh, regulators, and these are the elites and experts, uh, which apparently are corrupt and are not supposed to be trusted. Now, that was my preferred definition, and this is the minimal definition of populism. So everybody else who offers a definition of populism usually adds something on top of that. Uh, usually says something uh, additional to these two elements, which is anti-elite and anti-pluralism. So for example, Jan Werner uh, Müller talks about the anti-elite, anti-pluralism and identity. So he talks about the identity politics uh, where you define what moral people is, uh, which people are real people, which people are pure people. And uh, uh, Mueller admits that not all identity politicians are populist, but uh, I would add to that that there are many people, many politicians that we normally would call populists who are not identity politicians. Now, there is also a very important book by Norris and Engelhardt about authoritarian populism. They recognize that populist, uh, populism is a style of discourse, uh, but again, it's... Uh, it's uh, anti-elite, and uh, again, in Norris and Engelhardt to focus on authoritarian populists, uh, it's also authoritarian. And so uh, I would say that this definition is good if you want to, uh, if you want to define authoritarian populists, but they're also democratic populists. And Bernie Sanders is a democratic populist, um, and the Syriza in Greece is a democratic populist party. So, uh, for uh, many scholars of populists, nativism, identity, and authoritarian angle is an important feature, an important trait of modern populists. But I would say that that is actually uh, narrowing the uh, focus too much. And I would say that using the minimal definition of Mude and Mude Revira Kaltwasser is more useful. Yet, we do see that many of modern populists are authoritarian. And many of them promote strong leaders. Why? Uh, because once you think that people are homogenous and people need to rule, you don't actually need um, a division of powers, checks and balances, separation of powers. You only need one strong leader. And this is why it's very natural for many populist parties to say, we just need one strong leader because since all people are the same, you just need one person to rule it all. And, uh, and uh, this is, this is uh, an interesting, interesting feature. So it's not a coincidence that most of today's populists have authoritarian uh, leanings. And another issue is, of course, once you have a one charismatic leader, the message becomes simpler, it travels uh, faster, uh, becomes more convincing. and uh, and that may also be related to the rise of new communication technologies, and I'll talk about that. Now, let me briefly say that while economists usually think about populists as people who make non-sustainable promises, and political scientists focus on anti-elitism and anti-pluralism, these definitions are not totally unrelated. And the reason is very simple. If you want economic growth to deliver on your promises, you need good business climate, good investment climate. You need protection of property rights. And for that, of course, 
you need checks and balances. You need protection of minorities. You need protection of investors. And this is where the political scientist definition comes in because if you're anti elitist and anti pluralist you don't like checks and balances. You don't like judges. You don't like uh, uh, antitrust regulation and so on. And so we can clearly see that uh, how modern populist foreign power are trying to break uh, the institutions. So let me say that measuring populism is hard because there are many questions, questions involved. So first and foremost, do we want to define populist parties on a zero one basis or let's say on zero to 10 scale? And some uh, scholars use binary definition, some scholars use continuous. When we want to quantify the rise of populism, do we use vote share or share of seats? And of course, depending on a political system, um, you may transform 10% of the vote to zero seats or to 20% of the seats. And so much depends on how the political system is structured. Now, the no another thing is, do, can we compare, say, Latin America to Europe, presidential parliamentary regimes? How do we calculate averages? How do we weigh uh, countries uh, with more or less populism? And so. If you want to ask a question when and how there's been a rise of populism, there is not easy to give a single answer. Yet, I will try to give such an answer to you in a second. So just to give you a couple of uh, sources, here are, here are a few sources. And uh, the last uh, bullet item, for example, is 3wpopulist.org. You can just click on it. and. Uh, uh, you can see the data set, and I'll show you a graph from this data set. The first uh, re list in the last 10 years, the first list was uh, put up by Stein van Kessel, who is also part of this uh, populist project. And uh, his, uh, his book, published already in 2015, uses Moody's definition and lists populist parties. Then it's a very important Chapel Hill expert survey, where they survey all political scientists working on political parties in Europe, and they ask to position uh, European political parties on various issues, and then in their 2014, 17, and 19 rounds, they actually classify populists. So let me actually skip uh, those graphs and uh, show you the recent uh, uh, the recent um, uh, events. So if you uh, ask a question, do we think that that's been a global rise recently? The answer is yes. So this is uh, a chart from uh, Danny Roderick's paper, and you see there was a uh, rise in 21st century where vote share, if you look at the global data set, um, you see that the vote share went from 10% to 20 plus percent in 21st century. And Roderick argues that most of this rise was not in Latin America, but it was in Europe. And most of this rise was not due to left wing populists, this is the solid line, but uh, due to right wing populists who are the dashed line. And uh, there is a paper by political scientists from Bocconi who show that most of this rise is actually at radical right who are, are anti-trade uh, right parties. So this is a chart from uh, uh, Norris and Engelhardt who also find uh, a, a rise even though, even though their rise happens a bit earlier and uh, their data on the recent decade is not actually too convincing. This is our own paper. Let me actually skip that. Let me show you this graph and then take, take your question. So what I'm doing here, I took different data sets from different papers and I tried to uh, um, zero in on uh, European countries and try to make it comparable. And so this is the vote share over time uh, from the last election. So what is the vote share of populist parties in the last election? Uh, over the last uh, 20 years in um, in the recent 20 years in Europe. And so you see that uh, you have different party definitions, populist party definitions, you have different uh, country sets. So some of these uh, charts are uh, focusing on 33 party uh, countries, some on 28 uh, in Europe, but the graph is the same. It's always an increase by something like 10 percentage points from 10 to 20 or from 15 to 25. And in that sense, the takeaway is very clear. Populism is on the rise, 
Some of this rise has happened before 2010, but it really took off in uh, the last 10 years. And you can see that as well here. So the real growth started after the crisis, even though there was some growth before. And this is this uh, chart, the same chart from the populist project where you see uh, a longer period of time, but again, you see that the real growth had started in the last 10 years. So let me stop here uh, for uh, maybe answering a couple of questions, if you have questions. Yeah, okay. um, there's one question, Sergey. Um, I don't know if you can see the Q&A, but I can read I it. see the Q&A, yeah, I see okay. the Q&A. Good. Um, so so I, I'll answer Mikhail's question, which is, do you see differences, similarities in political economy of uh, G populism make this country great again? R populism, right wing, Corbyn and Kaczynski, and L populism, left wing, Chavez, etc. So uh, most of the rise in the recent times was more, uh, this G and R populism. And these are similar. So right wing populism is also um, very much correlated with uh, make this country great again. And the question is who your enemy is, and many right-wing populists, many G populists make your country great again. Identify enemies, not just elites, but also immigrants. But of course, elites for a populist, for a populist, elites are facilitating the capture of the country by immigrants and undermining of our legacy and tradition. And that's exactly the narrative of European right-wing populists. And this is something you can see in Trump's, uh, in Trump's uh, narrative as well. And Putin and, um, or, uh, and um, Erdogan actually also used this narrative before. And uh, by now, I would say Putin is no longer populist because populist is, uh, is a democratic leader. Uh, Erdogan is in between, but the story of Erdogan is also an anti-elite rise and use of a narrative like this and defense of the great past of Turkey, which for him is the Ottoman Empire. Now, one important difference is a lot of people would uh, compare populists to Nazis and to fascists. And basically, uh, the fascist states were of two kinds. Some, like German Nazis, would like to break the world and build a new wonderful world, like communists. And populists are not like that. Populists are more like corporatist states, like Mussolini's, where you want to restore the former greatness. So you don't look forward, you look backward. And of course, this is what President Trump is doing as well. Okay, so... Uh, Sergey, there is just one more question. I'm, I'm going uh -huh. to... The person has raised hands, hand, so I'm going to allow them to talk. Uh, so Shiv uh -huh. Kumar, you, yes, can, you can talk now. Mm -hmm. Shiv Kumar? Yeah, he's still muted. I, I just unmuted him. Uh -huh. Still muted. Oh. I can see that he's still talking muted. permitted. It says. Uh, uh -huh. I don't know how to do this then. Disable talking. Oh, while you are trying to unmute him, uh, let me answer the question of John Denew, who's asking uh, what role economics plays in employment versus trade. I will talk about that. I will talk about that right now. Okay. Okay. Uh, maybe Shiva Kumar, you will try to uh, ask a question uh, online. Yeah, maybe because I'm I'm pressing the unmute, but it's not doing anything. It says talking permitted, but. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Anyway. There is there is there is a question from Schumann uh, about uh, whether um, we can use Hotel and Downs model in political science um, for analyzing populism. Uh, the answer is, and you have. If, I have time to talk about this, that we need multidimensional politics to understand populism, modern populism. So Hotel and Downs model usually looks at one dimensional class struggle between rich and poor, but uh, populists usually are at the extremes of that, extreme left and extreme right, and then they merge, and they merge against the center. And in order to model this uh, new reality better, you need a multidimensional model where you have this cultural divide between liberal and conservative and also nativist divide between nativists and globalists. And I'll talk about that. So it's not enough to use unidimensional model. So one important thing which I didn't say is that if, uh, populists are not only getting high vote share, they also are getting into power 
And so this is a chart from an unpublished paper by Funke, Schuller, and Trebesh, who looked uh, at the populace in 60 large countries accounting for 95% of global GDP and count populist governments. And they show that today we have unprecedentedly many populist govern governments. So in 2018, we had 26 countries with populist govern governments. Uh, so 26%. So this is, this is uh, 16, 16 countries, sorry. 16 countries in this sample. And uh, of course, we all know these countries, but what this paper says is this is historically unprecedented. Nowhere near we have something like this. And this is all 21st century. And most of this rise between 2000 and 2018 was right-wing populists, even though the left-wing populists also got to office um, in many countries. So, so why is it uh, the rise of populism and uh, why now? Um, uh, so the candidate explanations are economic factors and non-economic factors. So economic fa factors, long-term trends, globalization, trade, competition with imports and so on, and technological change, automation. And so both things may create major dislocations in the labor market. And if national governments don't know how to compensate the losers, the losers will feel that the system is unfair and will rise against the system. So this is a pretty important issue. Then another issue is the recent global crisis. I'll talk about that. And then uh, the good news is if you think that populism is driven by economic factors, uh, if it's driven by economic policy mistakes, then uh, solutions kind of present yourself. Correct your economic policy and things will improve. Now, there is also a school of thought which is cultural, which is it's not about economics, it's about culture, it's about identity, or it's about cultural backlash against postmodernist values, the silent revolution, as it's called by Roland, uh, Ronald Engelhardt. And so here it becomes much more difficult. If you're deeply concerned about your identity, I'm not sure how I can change your views. And so things are not as simple because cultural explanations are problematic because it's very hard to say, okay, cultural divides are long-term divides, persistent divides. So why now? What has happened today to activate these cultural divides? And I'll talk about that briefly. And then finally, there is a very important argument, uh, which is communications technology. We now have unprecedented rollout of mo mobile broadband internet, which may be specifically uh, suitable for populist message. Okay. Uh, I see now the, the Shivakumar typed his question, which is, uh, has COVID pandemic seen further rise of populism and so on and so on. Um, and will populist leaders expe uh, be expected to face credibility issues in the coming days? So this survey, and especially the paper I, I, I sent to the organizers of the seminar, this paper was written literally in the end of February. And now we are thinking about adding a section on the interaction between COVID and populism. And basically, that's been an explosion of research looking at how populist leaders uh, try to stand up to the pandemic and uh, in general they don't do a good job so Boris Johnson has not done a good job Donald Trump has not done a good job and so on and of course the reason is they don't like experts they don't like elites and if you don't trust the expertise things don't work well will that be exposed to the voters I'm optimistic in the sense that uh, 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 voters will see that you, you cannot disrespect the expertise when stakes are so high. When we are talking not about percentages, points of inflation, but about hundreds of thousands of lives at stake. So on that side, I'm optimistic. On the other side, I'm quite pessimistic because we also see that the communication tools that populists use convince the public to behave wrongly. So there is now a number of paper, papers that show that people who watch Fox News are less likely to follow the medical advice and are more likely to um, be infected and actually die. And the same is true for people who vote for Trump. They're less likely to follow 
medical, uh, medical advice and so on. But uh, in that sense, we don't know. The jury is still out. So John Deneu says the populism needs fear to work. So you have to be afraid of something. Um, so that has been a debate there. Uh, and indeed, there are some economists who believe that you need a populist offer protection from some risks. And there is a paper by Luigi Guiza and co-authors who uh, try to define populism like this. And interestingly, in the last draft, they ditched this definition. And we converge on this definition, uh, which is anti-elite and anti-pluralism. And um, uh, whether, uh, how, uh, whether I can give you a, uh, a, uh, an example of a populist who doesn't use fear, that's a good question. Uh, let, me, let me think about this. So, uh, so let me go back to explanation. So uh, economic drivers. So what happens with globalization? Globalization uh, promotes economic growth, but of course it creates both winners and losers. Um, losses are concentrated in specific uh, locations and among specific occupations, and they're large per capita. So uh, if you're a consumer of imported goods and services, you benefit a little bit from lower prices. If you're a worker in an industry which is competing with Chinese imports, you lose your job. And uh, unfortunately, may, many national governments have not compensated you, uh, losers fully. Now, technological progress is somewhat similar, uh, where you, you have, uh, where you have uh, uh, new technology, which increases average productivity, but also creates winners and losers. If you compete with robots, you are likely to lose your job. And uh, there, like in globalization, the winner takes all. So if you own the best technology and sell to global market, you're likely to be richer and richer due to faster globalization and faster automation. And uh, that may create inequality, that may generate many losers. And uh, in that sense, it may trigger, especially if losers are not compensated, uh, it can trigger anti elite reaction, anti-system reaction, if you will. And then global crisis is uh, somewhat different. So global crisis um, is uh, um, something which was unprecedented in the lives of today's workforce. So most of the people losing the job during 2008, 2009 have never seen a crisis of that magnitude in their lifetimes. And so that was the biggest crisis since the Great Depression, and it was unlike pandemic, and unlike the COVID, that crisis was caused was caused by um, economic dislocation. So it was endogenous to the system. You can claim COVID to be exogenous. Now politicians have made many mistakes, but here you've seen corruption, you've seen uh, deregulation that probably went too far, and on top of that, you also saw austerity after the crisis, which also caused substantial economic pain. So these are the th three factors, and I have lots of slides, and I can show you many graphs, but basically the story is we now have a lot of evidence from the U.S. and Europe that competition with uh, Chinese imports has created uh, labor market polarization and vote for populists. So there is now a lot of evidence, and the most famous uh, set of papers is by Outer Dorn and Hansen, so called the China shock in the US. And you have a set of papers about this. But the same is true for Europe. You also can see China shock papers for Europe, and mostly it's about it's about it's by Kalanton and Steining, but also by other authors. And um, it's uh, true for both globalization, competition with Chinese imports, and um, and uh, robotization. And I'm happy to talk about, um, sorry, I'm happy to talk about uh, uh, the methodology, but all of these papers use some kind of identification strategy, mostly uh, using Bartic instruments. So basically, in order to predict the dislocation in, in the US, you look at how it worked out in Europe. And they mostly use similar data sets. So in terms of globalization, they use uh, China shock competition uh, with uh, Chinese imports. Uh, 
And in terms of automation, they actually use the data set of industrial robots from International Federation of Robotics. And I'm happy to talk about that if there are questions. So let me now uh, uh, stop again and uh, try to answer questions if there are any. So uh, how does inequality fit with the explanation about the rise of populism? We talk about homogeneity of the people. I wonder what, uh, how it squares with inequality. So, and then the other question is by Syed is, dissatisfaction with traditional politicians who have failed the people. So uh, both of these questions are right on target. So populism by definition is the dissatisfaction with the current mainstream political elite. And it's always about this. So if the system doesn't work for me, who is to blame? The government. But in most of Western countries, the government consists of two centrist parties, center left and center right, who replace uh, each other in every or every other election. So populists say both of those parties are wrong and we need a radical change. So this is the story. Now the question about inequality is actually a great question. Why? Because uh, you would think if public is homogenous, how come we focus only on some losers and not on the aggregate welfare? And the answer is well, if you have a very active group of people who lose a lot from globalization or automation, these people um, communicate their concerns more actively and they're more loud and more noticeable. Okay, you froze there. Okay, I froze. Oh, oh, okay, okay. You're I'm back. back. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so let me see if I, if I can uh, find a better internet connection. But uh, let me continue actually, and if, 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 if I freeze again, I'll, I'll try to switch to potentially to backup channel. Anyway, so it is a, if, you, if you think about uh, the uh, impact of globalization and, um, and automation, we are talking about uh, 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 a major job polarization trend where about 10 percentage point of labor force, which used to be in middle paid occupation, uh, is, sh is shifted either upward or downward. So if you look at the structure of jobs, and I guess I have a, uh, let me find this table here, which I think summarizes it all. So this is a, a table for Europe uh, by uh, Ghost Mining and Solomons, which uh, shows you employment in lowest paying occupation, nine. Uh, middle paid occupation and eight uh, and eight highest paid occupation. So these are the beneficiaries of globalization. And these jobs are also created even though they are not paying well. But jobs in the middle are destroyed. So if you look across countries, in most countries, about 10 percentage points of employment uh, are destroyed in the middle of the distribution and moved either towards a higher paid or lower paid uh, parts of skill pyramid. And so we are not talking about 90% dislocation. We are talking about 10% dislocation. But of course, for this 10%, it's a huge problem. And uh, some of these people in the middle move out of labor force. Some of them move to the lower paid occupation. And uh, in this case, of course, these people have a job, but this is not a good job. It's a bad job. And so only people at the top are very happy. But these are the people who are engineers, lawyers, bankers, scholars, uh, entertainers. So these are the beneficiaries of globalization and automation. And these are the elites which are hated. It's not a trivial number of people. So in Finland, these people are 40% of the labor force. In many countries, it's 30%. But still, these are the people in the middle who claim to be the representatives of the real people. So let me jump ahead uh, and talk a little bit about the crisis. So basically, this is, as I said, the first major economic crisis. Well, the global crisis was short. And the good news about short crisis, if you can time it easily, if you have a big shock, it's easier to study it and identify it as a shock that drives both economic dislocation, such as increase in unemployment, and political repercussions, such as vote for populists. That's why there is so much research on this issue. And there is now much evidence that global crisis, 2008, 
really brought a lot of votes towards um, uh, populists. And again, we are talking, when I say a lot, I mean 10 percentage points, 15 percentage points, but relative to what populists used to be at 10 percentage points. Well, it's doubling their vote share, which in many cases is enough to bring the populist into the office, into the government. And so then in Europe, this crisis was a bit longer because of austerity and some policy mistakes. And um, in that sense, it's not just the crisis itself that is blamed for populists, but also subsequent austerity uh, and the policy mistakes. So let me skip the, uh, this uh, short paper by Stevenson and Wolfers which looks at the uh, crisis of trust in the elites in the United States as an implication of the crisis. Let me talk a little bit about our own paper by Jan Algan, uh, 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 Elias Papayano, Evgenia Passari, and myself. We look at the whole of Europe and we look at how change of unemployment before and after the crisis resulted in the rise of populism. And basically we find that one percentage point of the rise in the regional local unemployment results in one percentage point increase in populist vote share. And in some of those regions, we saw 10%, 20% increase in, in, uh, in uh, uh, vote share so, uh, in, and in uh, unemployment as well. If you look at the right-hand side chart here, this is the histogram of distribution of unemployment rates in European subnational regions. And you see that this histogram was had a mass point around zero, and now it has a mass point around 10. It, when I say now, I'm talking about 2013-14. And uh, some regions had unemployment in the range of 20 and 30, which was not happening before. And we show that there is a strong correlation between change in unemployment and different uh, change in vote share for populace in European subnational regions. And so we, are, we identify this effect as causal by using pretty much Bartic instruments. It's a bit more sophisticated. We look at pre-crisis structure of the regional economy. We predict the increase in unemployment during the crisis. And we show that there is a causal effect of increasing unemployment on the rise of populism. And the causal effect is actually even stronger. Each in one percentage point increase in unemployment rate predicts two percentage point increase in, in uh, vote share for populists. And the same is something that we find for in, in, the, in the study of Brexit. And then I should say that there are other papers that do that and also find that um, Brexit really was correlated with uh, increase in unemployment and much less so increase in immigration. I will, should say that last year, Timo Fetzers uh, published a paper on the relationship between austerity and Brexit vote. This paper came out in the American Economic Review and it shows that austerity policies that UK government implemented after the crisis had a major impact, uh, major contribution to the Brexit vote. So let me skip Sweden. There is also evidence on Sweden, Sweden but let me, let me now briefly talk about non-economic explanations. Let me actually pause here since I have uh, 15 minutes left and I still have questions on Q&A. Oh, okay, there are questions on children of 10% of the losers. Um, that's a great question, and my answer to that is, if we think about solutions, what needs to be done is, if you're a coal miner and you will never find a job, we need to make sure that your kids have access to education and health care. And countries that do that actually fare better in resisting populism. Um, uh, cultural versus economics, I'll talk about that, and uh, uh, then... Uh, Sup supporters of Trump derive utility from sticking it to certain people. Even though they may not receive transfers, they still derive utility to be at least better than the immigrants. If I have time, I'll talk about this. This is a great point. Okay, so what are the potential cultural explanations? There is Norris and Inglehart who talk about long-term trend. So Inglehart in, already in 70s wrote about this generational shift in um, um, uh, values where younger people have more tolerant, more postmodernist values, protection of minority diversity, and so on. And now Norris and Engelhardt say that there is a previous generation's backlash against that. Uh, roughly speaking, white middle-aged men looking like me stand up against the uh, global trend, global 
change, global transition to modern, postmodern values. And so we had a silent revolution and we now have cultural backlash against silent revolution. Another, another thing is immigration and identity where people worry that immigration flows are so large that the cultural identity of a nation, of a host nation, is under threat. Um, then another issue is simple security. Some politicians use fear, and this is where I would like to mention that, that immigrants come and commit crimes or commit uh, acts of terror. And then interestingly, in Eastern Europe, there is an issue of emigration. Basically, there are no immigrants in Hungary or Bulgaria, but people worry about emigration because in Bulgaria, for example, there are now 7 million people, it used to be 9 million people. In Baltic countries, actually, the uh, population shrank by one third. And uh, this, uh, some people in those countries worry that nobody will speak their language in 50 years. So anyway, so why now? So if you think about cultural explanation, the question is why now? First, there is a long-term trend in immigration. Globally, the number of immigrants, the share of population is the same. It's the same 3% of foreign-born citizens in, in the world, like it used to be 30 years ago and 40 years ago. But in developed countries, it's not true. The share of foreign-born people in developed countries over the last 20 years, over the last 30 years has doubled roughly speaking from five to 11% in Europe, for example. And then on top of that, you have this uh, extreme event of 2015, the refugee crisis. And so uh, when you talk about long-term trend, such as uh, silent revolution, cultural back backlash, you would ask the question, why now? And many people would say, and there is relatively little evidence for this, but many people would say there is a trigger. Um, either refugee crisis or global economic crisis triggers the awareness that the system doesn't work for me and uh, immigrants are getting ahead, women are getting ahead, and we middle-aged uh, men, white men, are not getting ahead. And so in that is probably the most exciting agenda here where economic shocks activate identity issues, activate back cultural backlash. And so maybe, maybe this is how it works. However, in our survey, we identify a paper which shows an example how you can trigger a cultural shock without economic shock. And there is a paper on Austria by Oxner and Röser, which shows how Austrian radical right par, a party, FPO, Freedom, Freedom Party of Austria, which used to be not Islamophobic, in 2005 has a leadership change who decided to become Islamophobic and anti-Turkish. And they start talking about how Turks uh, uh, invaded uh, uh, Austria in 16th and 17th century and pillaged the villages. And you see that the villages which used to be pillaged by Turks 300, 400 years ago now vote for populists. And so this is really striking. And there is no economics in it because it happened in mid 2000s before the crisis. And so this is a diff and diff chart where non-pillaged villages are in gray, pillaged villages are in, in uh, blue, and there was no difference before this anti-Turkish campaign by this party, and there was a huge difference afterwards. So they trigger the memories, the, the medieval memories, if you like, uh, and uh, were quite successful. Now, since I'm uh, running out of time, I will not talk too much about uh, the theory of using identity. But basically there is now a number of papers and we cover them in our survey. There is a number of models, theoretical models. Many of them you can trace back to a paper by Moses Shayu in 2009, who in turn refers to social identity theory by Teifel and Turner, um, so social psychologists and sociologists. And basically the story is people want to be part of a social group. They identify themselves with a group. And so there is a cognitive process of placing yourself in the group. And the social identity is endogenous. And so what we observe now is probably populists shaping those social identities. And uh, once you want to find a social group for yourself, you face a trade-off. Uh, you want to be an exemplary part of the group. You want to be respected within the group. But also you don't want to be a part of a marginal group, which uh, doesn't pay off. And so these models really look into psychological issues such as salience of issues. 
And uh, 20 years ago, the most important political conflict was left versus right in terms of rich versus poor. And now you have two more dimensions, including, as I said, globalists versus nativists and, uh, and cultural liberals versus, versus cultural conservatives. And there is a number of, there are a number, number of papers that do theoretical analysis of this, much less is done empirically. So th there is uh, some empirics in, uh, in uh, Tabellini's paper, but there is also an exciting paper and actually a book in French about France where the data are much, much better. And there is a paper by Jan Algan, Elizabeth Bisley, Daniel Cohen, and Marcel Foucault who look at the um, French data where they have a huge uh, survey of voters. And uh, they show why some people vote for left-wing populists and some people vote for right-wing populists. And basically they say that politics now is again, as I said, two-dimensional. So you have quality of life, life satisfaction, horizontal access, and uh, trust to other people and trust in institutions, trust in the system on the vertical axis. And basically, um, uh, people who voted for the system are the people who, who voted for Macron, center, Fillon, center right, Amon, center left. And then you have people who have reasonably high level of education, reasonably high uh, uh, income, but much lower than those who voted for the system. So these are the losers, relative losers, but these are people who believe in the system and they vote for redistribution, they vote for left-wing populists. And uh, people who vote for Marine Le Pen, right-wing populists, are the same people who abstain from the elections. There's a disillusion left behind and they have no trust in the system and they have low quality of life, low income, low employment opportunities. And that two-dimensional figure also shows you why we have difference in left and right wing populists and which ones are uh, the uh, voters for the ones and for the others. Now, we also have a survey of literature of the link between immigration and populist vote. Since I have no time, let me skip it. If you have questions, I'll be happy to go back. But basically, interestingly, the evidence is mixed. There are papers which show that exposure to immigrants, exposure to refugees, especially if there are not too many, like 1% of population or 2% of population of a specific uh, community, actually is positive for anti-populist vote. If there are too many refugees or too many immigrants, like, like above 4 or 5% of natives, then uh, it probably triggers pro-populist vote. And much depends on timing, composition of immigrants, skill composition of immigrants, and so on. I should say that this is not just OLS analysis. All these papers have well-identified uh, strategy to, uh, uh, to find uh, causal effects, and they do find causal effects, and these causal effects go in both directions. So I think more research is needed, but also we need to understand that exposure to immigrants, exposure to refugees may be heterogeneous. And different kinds of exposure, different kinds of contact may result in different kinds of political implications. Now, let me just say literally one word about new technology. So there is now strong evidence that, well, the explosion of internet and especially of mobile broadband internet has resulted in growth of populism. So you see on the left-hand side, I show you internet users per 100 per, uh, uh, inhabitants and you see the main take off in the developed countries happened in uh, uh, early 2000s. Uh, but the right-hand side is important because it shows how uh, the broadband internet is no longer fixed broadband internet, but is more like um, uh, mobile broadband internet. And so basically what we see is in the last 10 years, the internet has moved from being slow to being fast and from being... Uh, uh, fixed to being mobile. And now majority of people in the world have access to third generation or fourth generation mobile technology and that is good for social media and social media are good for populace. And so there is a first paper on this topic was about Italy, how, uh, how broadband internet uh, helped uh, five star movement. And then we have our own paper with Nikita Melnikov and Nikaterina Zhuravska, which shows that mobile broadband internet uh, actually um, helped populist vote share in Europe. This is the chart which shows that right-wing populists gain something like 10 percentage points because of, um, it's, it's actually 10 percentage point if you go from zero coverage to 100% coverage. So in reality, it's actually half of that. 
And left-wing populists got uh, a bit less, but comparable number of votes because of rollout of uh, third generation mobile broadband internet. And um, uh, we show that non-populist opposition didn't gain. And we show that the green parties also didn't gain, even though green is also a, a political family which is against the system. But we believe that the current social media, the new social media, the modern social media help uh, populists more than they help non-populist opposition greens because they uh, provide a platform for critical simple message and this is what populists love and that's what they do. So really briefly, uh, what do populists do when they come to power? Let me again skip that if, if, if I have time uh, in questions. Um, there is now a lot of research using doppelganger economies, what's called uh, synthetic control methods. And this is, for example, a paper on Brexit uh, by uh, Bourne and others, which shows that actual evolution of British economy was one or two or three percentage points below the counterfactual, what could have been if uh, UK remained normal in 2016. And uh, for Trump, actually, there is nothing like this. Probably in 2020, Trump has caused a lot of damage, but before that he hasn't. And uh, basically in their global paper, Funke, Shularik and Trebish do this counterfactual analysis using those 60 countries that I mentioned. And they show that the damage populists do is huge. The uh, average populace creates 10%, 10 percentage point of GDP damage relative to counterfactual. And with that, they don't manage to re reduce inequality. They do destroy um, freedom of press and judiciary independence. And they're also less likely to exit after losing an election. Populists are kicked out of office by other means, such as a coup or something like this, because they try to entrench themselves, undermine political checks, checks and balances, and reduce political competition. And that, that uh, negative economic input, uh, impact is actually true for both right-wing populists and left-wing populists. So let me conclude here. So we have a, just a few minutes for questions. Um, what is populism? So here is the, my preferred answer he is anti-elite, anti-pluralist. What are the drivers? We have strong evidence for economic drivers, globalization, automation, impact of the crisis. Uh, and impact of the crisis is both uh, spike in unemployment and austerity. Then strong evidence for the role of uh, mobile broadband internet and less conclusive evidence for culture, but probably uh, there is now an emerging consensus without strong evidence, yeah, that uh, economic shocks, economic insecurity triggers cultural divides, cultural um, divisions which uh, support the populace. Now, populists in power, I can find two examples where populists didn't do a bad job. So Trump, until at least until 2020, there is no net impact and you can say that Trump probably until this year didn't manage to destroy American checks and balances fully. And Poland um, has actually outperformed the counterfactual, but you can, uh, I can talk about that. There are alternative theories, maybe it's been explained by other factors. What should be done? I should say that uh, we don't really know. There are many discussions. I'm happy to talk about that if you have questions, but uh, there is, very little research on what works, what doesn't work against populism. And basically, uh, since we believe that economic factors are important, what needs to be done is losers have to be compensated. Communities and people which are left behind by globalization automation crisis should be taken care of. Regarding the internet, mainstream politicians should learn how to use internet and social media in particular. So this is, this is what important to uh, be done. And then to bridge elites and masses, new political institutions need to be created. And one such political institution is deliberative democracy, citizens assembly, social conventions, something which is now tried out, trialed out in many, many countries, and it seems to work. And that's been done in Ireland very successfully, and in France now. And so this is, this, in Canada, this is actually uh, great, great work. Okay. So I, I uh, conclude here and we have a few minutes for questions. I'm looking at uh, 
the question uh, from Sied, which is uh, any evidence that traditional politicians are responding to the rise of populism? Uh, as I gather watching the media, there is no change in their approach or behavior. So this is, this is a great question. And I think there is an issue, not just of behavior, but of selection. So what happens in modern world to become a politician, you need to go through a career which uh, encourages technocrats and discourages charismatic leaders. So people like uh, Obama are very rare in uh, mainstream parties. And the reason for that is current society is very complex. You need to have a lot of skills to govern a region or a city or a country. And so what you do, you go through elite schools and you may be of modest background, but by the time you reach the presidential office, probably you have gone to an elite school and you've only worked in politics. And so you don't connect to people because you've never worked outside of politics. And so that creates this divide between elite and the people. And so I think what needs to be done is the political selection. So we need to somehow have more rotation, more revolving door, if you like, of people from normal life entering politics. And for that, there should be incentives for entering politics. And I guess that also means that we need to pay our politicians better. So, okay. So, other questions? What, which is the name of the paper by Funky, Shularik, and Trebesh? So this paper, uh, as far as I know, is still not available. So they submitted it to a conference which I organized, and that's how I got to read it. I cite it, as they allowed me to cite it. Uh, and the name of the paper is actually available in our survey. So if you look it up, you'll, you'll see. But basically, it's, it's, a, it's a very important paper because they look at a large sample of countries over 100 years and they actually prove using macroeconomic data, but nonetheless, they prove that if you are run by a populist government 15 years later, uh, your GDP is 10 percentage points lower. So this is what's called synthetic control methods where you create a doppelganger economy and, uh, and you can create a macroeconomic counterfactual for your GDP. Uh, GDP series. Okay. Um, uh, there is a question about Mikhail's uh, incremental impact due to globalization, technological change is going to decrease while identity civilization differences are there to stay. So, this is a great question. And uh, let me say that we refer to a paper by Yota Margalit, who argues that, well, if I tell you that uh, Brexit was decided by economic factors, because unemployment went up by five percentage points uh, in those areas. And so Brexit was a very narrow vote. So we are talking about several percentage points. Um, but then we can explain 5% of 20 of 52% of Brexit voters, but not the remaining 47%. And the remaining 47% is cultural. I more or less disagree with that, but still it's a great paper. I encourage you to read this Margaret's 2019 paper, uh, where he talks about these issues in particular. Yet, uh, it's not all clear that uh, cultural divides are here to stay. And the reason for that is, in many countries, kids of white uh, manufacturing or coal miners manufacturing workers or coal miners get access to education and become part of the new globalized uh, technological economy. And so here we can be optimistic. Second, the cultural issue. If you believe the cultural backlash, much of that is generational. So as older people become fewer and younger people with uh, modern values become more numerous, they're less likely to vote for Brexit. So for example, if you look at demographic data on Brexit vote, then if this vote happens today, simply because there are fewer older people and more younger people, the Brexit vote would already be uh, different. It would, the outcome would be different because younger people predominantly voted remain and older people predominantly voted, um, voted uh, leave. Education factor, uh, education factor matters and uh, and uh, educated people usually vote against populists because educated people 
understand better that populists cannot deliver on their on their promises. And um, what is very important, that's what I mentioned in passing, talking about uh, Shularic paper, Funke uh, Trebesh Shularic paper, is that populists get into power and then they see they cannot deliver on their promises. And some of them, like uh, Syriza in Greece, just gets voted out. Fine. But some of them manage to subvert democratic institutions, like Orban, and you no longer can kill him out because he controls courts, media, um, and everything, all political institutions. And so whatever you do, he's there, he's entrenched. And uh, that, of course, results in underperformance in economic terms. Economic promises are not met, but opposition cannot come back because it's no longer a liberal democracy. So this, this is one of the biggest dangers of populists that I see. Not the economic problem, but more of a political problem. Okay. So I guess uh, we are over yeah. time by now. Yeah. Uh, yes, I think we should stop here. Thank you so much, uh, Sergey, for a very interesting talk. Uh, it was really fascinating. Um, something that I had never, you know, sort of looked at populism aspects of political economy. So it was really good, interesting. I hope uh, everybody um, uh, uh, enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, thank you so much again, Sergey. Thank you to all the participants. And um, we'll stop here. Uh, have a nice rest of the summer. And I'll see you at some point, I suppose, uh, when, when things become normal. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Matlob. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, for great uh, questions. Thank you.